Hey, y'all, it's an honor to share with you uh, this morning, evening or afternoon, depending when you're watching this message. Uh, I really want to thank our great uh, worship team leaders for recording some campfire sessions and just, yeah, helping us connect with the way we do worship. And it's been brilliant to watch. I know last Sunday it was awesome to watch before the message, and I'm sure this Sunday it's going to be awesome to watch as well before the message. And I really hope you enjoyed our whole series on the Upside Down Kingdom and just how Jesus changes everything. And everyone who shared in this series did an excellent job. And we just really hope that you remember this Upside Down Kingdom is based on self-sacrificial love. And we hope you're able to remember that, reflect on that, and, and grow in that with Christ. And this week we're starting a new series, and we're going to be working on this series for the whole month of May looking at this new topic, and what we're going to be looking at is the Gospel of Luke. And kind of like our our theme is a Savior for all people through the power of forgiveness. So we're going to be unpacking this for the month of May and exploring it. So let's begin by exploring some of the context around this Gospel, since, you know, this is our first thing, and we're kind of looking at the beginning of the book. And context is really key when it comes to understanding Scripture and understanding uh, Gospels when we read them. And all the evidence points that this Gospel was written by Luke, who was a traveling companion of Paul. 
And Luke wrote this as a response to a question that Theopolis, who was a Roman official and who wanted to know what Christianity was about. So we know that because in the very beginning, he mentions this name and he writes to him just explaining that everything he's heard and the witness and giving accounts for it. Because this Roman official was a wanting accounts, wanting to figure out what Christianity was about. And not only did Luke write, you know, the Gospel of Luke, he also wrote another account. So his first account's about the life of Jesus. You find that in the Gospel of Luke. He also wrote about the early church in a second volume known as the Book of Acts. So Luke and the Books of Acts kind of go together. They're kind of like two volumes in this response to Theopolis, who's wanting to know more about Christianity and what it looks like. And I know we might find it a bit odd that in ancient cultures, they demanded evidence to support their beliefs, just as we do nowadays. And I think it's really cool that Luke kind of sets out on this great reporting quest uh, led by the Holy Spirit. And he starts gathering information, checking for evidence, verifying sources, using critical evaluation, and planning an orderly arrangement of materials. And he does this because we know Luke is a very educated Gentile. So he's very wise, he's very smart, he has a lot of knowledge, and he knows that evidence is key even in ancient cultures. And one of the overarching themes throughout Luke and Acts is that Jesus is a savior for all people through this power of forgiveness. And that is why throughout this series, we're going to look and unpack this power of forgiveness found in Christ. And each week, we're going to journey a little bit more throughout the, the Gospel Luke. And today, I want to look at a story found in Luke chapter 2, verses 25 to 35, after Jesus' birth and circumcision. And his parents are following every letter of their law and customs by waiting the period of time required after the purification to bring him to the temple and present him to God. And we can read this in, in Luke verses 23 to 24, which says, Just as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn will be dedicated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And I know that might sound like a lot of mumble jumble for us, but for me, that really shows that, you know, Mary and Joseph, they were trying to follow their customs and their law. They were bringing, you know, Jesus to the temple after that time of purification to present him to God. They're trying to follow all these standards. And then we get into our story. So that I want you now to open up your Bibles if you have them. And feel free to open up to Luke uh, chapter 2, verses 25 to 35. And let us just read some of the verses found in here. And I want to start off by just reading verses uh, 25 to 26, which says, There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. And I just think that's amazing. And I want to just stop there for a second, because all we kind of know about Simeon is that we're told he's a righteous and devout man. So obviously he would have been known in his community, known for, you know, being a really righteous individual, someone you could trust, this devout Christian. He's eagerly waiting the coming of the Messiah. He's a devout Jew. And then we're also told another thing, that the Holy Spirit was moving. And it revealed to him that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. And I just think that's pretty awesome. That's a pretty amazing promise for someone to get. But I want to keep reading and let's read uh, verses 27 to 28 now. So it says this, Guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple when the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform for him what was customary under the law. Simeon took him up in his arms Praise God and said, and it goes on, Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised. For my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples, a light of for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. 
And I want to pause there again because I just think it's amazing what Simeon says. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people, Israel. So he sees this baby, parents bringing a baby into the temple to do what's customary in their time. And he sees this baby and he just has that divine revelation in that moment. The Holy Spirit moves, he, he senses, he, can, he knows it's the Lord's Messiah. And he goes to him, lifts him up and says this beautiful thing, which gets me thinking, I don't know about anyone else, but how do you think Mary and Joseph are going to respond to that? Like, I know they've seen amazing stuff happen. And, you know, before this, we have the birth of Christ and some of the stuff that goes in that. And there's already been divine intervention and all this stuff happening within the birth of Jesus. But I still think Mary and Joseph don't understand it all. I don't think they have a full comprehension of what this whole Messiah thing means. And also, they're being like their first time parents. And I don't know about anyone else, but if you've ever been a first time parent, it's kind of like a bit of a blur with how everything happens. So I really think Mary and Joseph aren't immune to this. And they kind of are still comprehending what Jesus is going to do, who he's going to be. Like, they don't know it all. They don't really fully understand this term Messiah. So let's just see how they respond in our next verses, uh, 33 to 35, which say, his father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary, indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed. And a sword will pierce your own soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Could you imagine hearing that as Mary or Joseph, putting yourself in their shoes for a minute? And Mary gets this extra bit about a sword that's going to pierce her soul, which I know would have been hard to hear as a mom. And it has a lot to do with some of the stuff she was going to have to witness and see her son endure. And some of the things she was going to have to work through with her son being the Messiah. And this whole encounter is amazing. And it already shows us an aspect of this power of forgiveness found in Christ. And while I know it's hard to stop here, because we want to keep reading this gospel account of Jesus presented at the temple. And we read about someone else who comes up and notices Jesus as well. And I want to encourage you to read that in your Bibles later on. But I want us to try and just pause here and just think for a moment about two major things spoken about Jesus in this story. And they're spoken in this story uh, by Simeon. And the two things that really stand out to me and the two major things that I think uh, Luke's wanting us to grab hold of is what Simeon says about Jesus, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people, Israel. And then he also says something to Mary. And if we take out the little bit that was just, you know, for Mary about, you know, a sword that would pierce your soul, having to witness some of the things she wouldn't have to witness with her son being the Messiah. He said this, a sign that will be opposed that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And I believe when we really sit with these two statements and we sit with God on this passage, it really shows us the power of forgiveness found in Christ shines a light on our own hearts. And this light of forgiveness in Christ shines throughout all the darkest areas of our hearts we try to hide. And we discover this light. And it's a beautiful thing. And one of our first instincts is to oppose it. But I believe we need to lean into it. We need to lean in to this power of forgiveness found in Christ. And it makes me think, what does it look like to lean into this power of forgiveness found in Christ? Which signs 
a light on our own hearts, which we can get out of those two statements that were told about Jesus from Simeon. So what does that look like? Maybe we would be able to embrace the darker parts of our hearts with this light of forgiveness and allow Christ to move with total freedom in our own hearts. And I believe if we are able to do that and able to really lean into it and let Christ move in our hearts with total freedom, it would show us that far too often our anger is a defense mechanism to protect our own ego. And that's something, you know, psychologists have found out uh, that's not, you know, that's something that I think has been revealed to lots of people, to us as Christians and to people in the world. And there's a lot of study around the brain and different things with anger. And it's really clear that really often anger is just a defense mechanism we use to protect our own ego, to protect things we don't want rattled. And I love a quote by Richard Rohr that I just want to share with you guys. Uh, it says this, Men must learn how to grieve, or they are inevitably angry or controlling, and they don't even know why. Now, I don't know about you, but I know that quote really uh, rings true for me in my own walk, in my own journey, and uh, something that's really, I've learned by leaning into this power of forgiveness that really shines a light on our own hearts and trying to, you know, lay down my ego and not resist it and lean into it more and more and more. And uh, I discovered uh, something. I'm, I'm not a perfect person. I mean, it's pretty easy to tell that. I mean, look at the way I dress and you know, some of the silly things that I do and struggle with saying some words. But uh, when I first came here, I was a bit angry all the time. Uh, I moved to Australia at 19, uh, had to leave and do all this stuff really, really quick. And I was so angry the first couple of years Kim and I were married. I didn't even know why I was angry. I didn't even know why I would try to control so much. And I would rationalize it with all these different things. And now, every now and then, this anger still creeps up. It's still there. And I try to rationalize it or control things. And uh, when I started leaning into it, leaning into this power of forgiveness that I know we have in Christ, letting his light shine on all the darkest areas in my heart, I kind of discovered something. And if we go to the next slide, you'll you'll see an amazing photo of me, right? Look at that hair. We need to get that back. I don't know if I can grow it back, but I want to. But that's me at 19. So I'm a 19-year-old kid. That's at a job that I had because I had two jobs trying to work and uh, save up money to come to Australia because I was dating Kim. Lots of stuff happened. And she was about to have our son. Eventually, I got to come here. But that's me at 19. Not a, not a care in the world, really, as you can tell by my facial expression. I think I was just having fun with a couple of my friends the week or two before I came to Australia, and I kind of didn't have much on. And then I want to go to the next photo. And you can uh, see in this photo, besides the gorgeous hair that's still there, uh, you can see that I'm holding my oldest son, Caleb. I'm still 19. The time frame between that other photo and this one is probably only two or three months. And what I discovered is a lot of times there was so much anger in me because there was still a 19-year-old kid that was angry. I had to grow up, leave everything I ever knew, uh, quit going to uni, change, you know, change my degree, my course that I thought I had in life planned out. All got changed. Left all my friends, all my family, 
And I'd love to say it was all on perfect terms, but it wasn't because it was quick. It was a lot of stuff happening. So I didn't get to leave everything on perfect terms. I, I came here and uh, got married. And on my wedding day, uh, I'm sure lots of people like to think about the friends and the, the family they're going to have there. For me, I had no friends or family. I had Kim and her mom and dad who I knew and her siblings that I knew and other people that I just met. I only knew for about a month. I got to call my dad and mom before I got married. I didn't get to have them there. I didn't get to pick, you know, my best mans or anything like that. And, you know, none of that. And then I even had a kid, a beautiful son. And I didn't get to hand them to my dad or to my mom or to all these people that I would have loved to hand them to. And I think I never grieved that. I'm still leaning into this power of forgiveness to shine a light in my own heart to try to grieve and forgive myself for that anger. Lean into it and allow that forgiveness we find in Christ to really embrace this 19-year-old kid on the inside who's still just angry and upset that he had to grow up so fast. And I found as I've leaned into that more and more, my anger's gone. I'm, not, I'm less controlling. And when it does bubble up and I can sense myself doing it, if I'm able and willing to really find a moment to sit with God and really let this power of forgiveness we find in Christ shine a light on, a, on my heart, it really does some amazing stuff. So I don't know what it is for you. Uh, I don't know what you may be going through, uh, but I really believe in a time of self-isolation, everything going on, it's a great time for us to really lean in to this power of forgiveness that we find in Christ and let it shine a light on our hearts. And if we do that, it will expose some of the darkness within our hearts. And it will allow us to embrace it, forgive ourselves, allow Christ to move in it more freely, which I believe will have a dramatic impact on us and those around us. And if you don't know if it would have a dramatic impact on those around you, just ask my wife, Kim, how it probably changed since the first couple of years we were married as a you know, 19 or 20 or 21-year-old kid who was just angry. And a lot of that has changed. And a lot of that is because I had amazing people that would tell me this kind of stuff, that would get me to lean in to Christ more and more. And I really believe this can have such a dramatic impact on those around us. And I think right now when we're forced to be self-isolated, forced to do more stuff on our own, maybe it's a good time to take advantage of that, to really lean into this forgiveness we find in Christ. So maybe during this time of self-isolation, and COVID-19, maybe it really is the perfect time to lean in to this power of forgiveness we find in Christ and let it shine a light on the darkest areas in our heart. I just want to close in, in prayer. So if you want to, you know, close your eyes or bow your heads, feel free, but I'm just going to close in prayer. God, I just really thank you for who you are. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your the power of your forgiveness that we find in Christ. And I just really pray that as we journey through the gospel of Luke and we learn more about this power of forgiveness, that you'll just allow us to lean into it more and more. And I just really ask that anyone watching this will just be able to, yeah, lean into that power of forgiveness, to open up their hearts, to let the light shine on some of the darkest areas, on some of the boxes that we, we don't like getting opened. I just pray that you'll be with us as we journey through that. You'll help us to love ourselves more, embrace those hurts and pains that we might have, put people around us to help us work through those pains and hurts, and really just wrap us up in your love and let us really sense and feel the power of your forgiveness. And your mighty, matchless name, God, Amen.
Thank you all and God bless. <laughs>